Hello and welcome to Jack Myers Ministries and Life Family Church Podcast. Be blessed by this week's message. All right, so I told you we're going to go through the whole book of Jude tonight. Don't be scared. There's only one chapter. <laughs> You're like, I oh, know, this is the problem with not reading your Bible. <laughs> So we're, we're reading our Bibles this year, right? If you have never read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, it's super important. Not only is this your heavenly father, this is your covenant, but this is your weapons manual. So if you're like, I, I, I feel like the enemy is kicking my can, like a tin can across the field. Um, this is your weapons manual, and we show up to learn how to use our weapons of mass destruction against the enemy. But if you don't even know what they are, much less how to use them, you will be defeated, just like the natural military. Imagine going into the army and them uh, issuing you a weapon and you not learning how to do it. I believe they train you to the point of disassembling it and reassembling it blindfolded. Why? You need to be skillful in handling your weapon. What, you thought there would be a giant spotlight every time you needed to aim and shoot that from heaven, that heaven was open in Jacob's ladder? No, we'll be in the pitch dark, the rain, the cold, the mud flying, and the bullets singing over your head. You needed to know how to assemble and disassemble that weapon without being able to see accurately. That's skillfulness. And so that's why God equates us to three-part beings, son, ser- servant, and soldier. So we, we come to church for weapons training, right? So if you didn't even bring your manual or you haven't read the manual, then you'll need to run 10 laps. <laughs> it's like, that's what they do in the military. That's just the cure-all for everything. My basketball coach thought that, and she called them suicides. It's like, whose, yours or mine? I don't know. I never understood that. I hope nobody else calls them that. That's terrible. So you in the book of Jude? Okay. Uh, now, everybody generally knows the one verse, Jude one twenty. Beloved, I build yourself up in most holy faith, but it's generally misquoted and it's, it's uh, misunderstood in its meaning. So we'll straighten that out and a lot of other things. Uh, but the, the theme of Jude, first of all, we know the author and the theme of it is contending for the faith. I find that word the intriguing because it's the same way Paul said, um, This gospel, in other words, there would be another gospel that would try to be preached. Contending for the faith means there would be a false option offered you. Is that not so? Everything God has, Satan tries to package a counterfeit. So we know that uh, you guys know the Bible is not in chronological order, right? Okay, because <laughs> Job was like in 800 years, and but he had its position way down the line, but it happened actually in the time period of Genesis in the first 1,200 years, closer to uh, year 800. So Jude, in uh, a little bit of history, is important because, again, who's the author, Bible doctrines, who's speaking, who are they speaking to, and what time period are they speaking about, or just some of the simple things of Bible doctrine. So Jude, I thought it was interesting, wrote this book in 66 A.D., 24 years prior to God's placement of it in the Bible because it's placed between 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Revelation. Notice it's the last thing before we go into the book of Revelation. So it was very important because John didn't write 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Revelation until 90 A.D., so it was written many years before, whether we know whether Jude was still around when it was, uh, but God decided to put it in that place. Why? You would think when we go through it that he wrote it last year because it's so applicable. Why? To the last days. And you're going to find yourself, if you weren't sure we were in the last days, you'd be like, oh my goodness, we're in the last days. Yeah. Pastor's been telling us that, right? Uh, it's something God wanted us to know near the end. Why? We needed our minds refreshed on exactly what was going on and what we were to do. What was our position to succeed in that? Some people try to say, hey, I was born in the wrong era. No, you were born for such a time as this. You have the full equipping of the grace for this place and this pace in the race has nothing to do with your comfortability. If you need comfort, get a better mattress. <laughs> so, um, you know, Jude and James were the half brothers of Jesus. And in verse one, I love how Jude says, the servant of Jesus Christ. We, they're all half brothers because they, they, Mary was their mother, but Joseph was their father, and Joseph was not Jesus' father. So uh, Jude and James were brothers. James, Jesus' brother, was the pastor of the church at Jerusalem and the one that wrote, wrote the book of James. He was not the James that was beheaded. That was John's brother. James and John, the sons of thunder. That was the James that was beheaded before the church woke up when they said, oh, that was easy, we'll take Peter too. And they said, no, 
Yeah, so James uh, is the church, pastor of the church of Jerusalem, and James and Jude were half-brothers of Jesus, amen? Okay, so Jude 1, are you with me, ready with your highlighters and your pens? Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them, so he says, this is who I'm writing to. It says to them, he's going to tell who he's writing to, sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ, and called. Are you called? You're all called. Now we have that established. We can move on. As you were like, I don't know if I'm called or not, or I think I'm called. You're called. It says right here. Uh, who am I writing to? The called. What? The saints. Those that are saved. We're all called. And so notice, though, that uh, the book of Jude is called Contending for the Faith. So it's, uh, but people will camp on what they're saved from. So we get saved and we put a gold cross on our neck. Nothing wrong with that. And we're, we, we want to stay at the foot of the cross. The foot of the cross is a finished work. So there's no point in staying there. It said, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father. He sat down because his work was finished, but you got up off your blessed assurance because yours just got started. So that is a finished work. But we want to go, thank God I'm saved too. We want to keep going back to that. It is not a place to go back to. Backwards is not a place to go to. Forwards is a place to go to. That's one part of your salvation. The first moment, the first part, and from then on, you're finished with the finished work. What are you going to do now? What, was you, what were you saved for? What were you saved to? And the reason people struggle, and he said, basically, you're not going to be preserved through this journey because you're not paying any attention for what you were saved to and what you were saved for on your way to it. We want to just go, thank you, Jesus, for, thank God for the cross. But after you've celebrated the cross, there's the rest of your life, and you can't spend the rest of your life and succeed as a Christian. In fact, you can easily backslide and let go of faith if you stay on the save too. Amen. Aren't you glad you came tonight? Yes. So he goes on to verse two. He says this, and this is just the greeting. I love Jude because he is taking his Glock and he's emptying the clip. He's bulleting everything. He go, he's going to go from Genesis to Revelation, from time to eternity, the millennium in one chapter. He good. <laughs> he must be related to Paul. Okay. Verbal brevity. Blessed are the short winded. They shall be heard again. Okay, so not just saved from. So he says, goes on, he says, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. So the Bible says mercies are new every morning. When is that? 1201. So if you're like, I'm just hanging on. Why people, oh, the witching hour is 1201. No, the hour of new mercy is 1201. If you're up at midnight worrying, go, boatload of new mercies just rode on in. <laughs> Yeah, you should be in bed sleeping because it's vain to stay up, stay up late and, and get up early and eat the bread of idleness through anxious worry, amen? But if you happen to be up at the midnight hour, look for the boat being rowed in of the new mercies. And it was not that you ran out at 1159 because Jesus said it was sufficient to the day. 11.59 and 59 seconds, the mercy was enough. And then the next second, you got a new boatload. As if you can find the end of the mercy of God. Amen? Amen. So he's not being flippant. It's just not a casual thing he's saying. He's saying, mercy to you. Peace and love be multiplied. So he is blessing them with their mouth. So it's not just saved from. We were saved from hell. That's awesome. <laughs> saved from sin. The biggest thing God has saved you from is you. And that's the part he wants you to focus on. The, the work of Christ to save you from sin and save you from hell is finished. But if you don't cooperate with him saving you from yourself, you won't fulfill your destiny. But it requires your full consecration. Pastor Marie, what is that? Get Wednesday night sermon if you missed it. What's consecration? How to do it in 40 minutes. Uh, he says, what the, himself, that's our sonship. What we were saved to is the servant and soldier part. Oh, we don't like that word. Hashtag save to serve. Saved to what? Serve. Amen. Saved for being a good soldier. Amen. So you were saved from things, but the rest of your life, you have to know what was I saved for? What was I saved to? That's the part you need to camp on because the sonship is my one directional relationship, God and me. No one else has included that. Only vertical, but we want everybody else to treat us like royalty. You'll be waiting until the millennial reign and pass that. Because that's a personal relationship with God. Amen. Servants don't care how they're treated. Right. Soldiers understand their role. Um, I was listening to a minister tell a story. He was just in Israel. 
last month. And he got to uh, be escorted by some special forces to spend some time with the IDF. And uh, he was watching one of their exercises and they train constantly every day, even though they're in the middle of war, they train relentlessly. And uh, he was, got to talk to them afterwards, and he asked the soldier, and he was just uh, a pastor, so he was just getting some information. He said, you know, your uh, commanding officer was, was pretty harsh with what he said. How do you feel about that? And the soldier's like, what you talking about, Willis? He did not understand his question. I don't understand what you're asking me. No, how, do you, how, do you, are you, how do you feel about that? He was pretty harsh. I don't feel. I don't have any feelings. He's saving my life. He, he's training me. This is necessary. This is my job. And what we've done is we forgot that part of our servanthood that meant I was this way. So I don't care if people treat me like a servant because I are one. Congratulations. I must be doing something right. <laughs> and we get upset about that. And then we forgot our soldiership. We're like, no, I'm just a son. I want to enjoy all the benefits of sonship. You can do that, but you can't do that without being a servant and a soldier. Amen. The king's son goes to battle. They all, all the kings and their sons, went, and when they didn't, they, went, they got in trouble. That's how David got in trouble on the balcony with Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. Okay, so uh, sanctified and called means he's going to separate us by his blood, but you are not separated unless you agree to it. In other words, the blood allowed, made provision for you to be separated and sanctified, but you don't have to walk in that. If you don't choose to do it for yourself and for God on a daily basis, you won't stay there. It won't happen. Because you can take back anything you want. You can take back the lordship of your, of your life. But uh, his saviorship doesn't come without the lordship. That's not going to work out for you. Amen? Okay. So uh, this is the save too. Jude is telling us to contend for the faith. That means we can't coast on the saved from part. We must contend for the saved too. This is the part we're called for. Uh, this keeps us preserved. He said, it will preserve you until that day. What day? The judgment day, the bema seat of Christ, which is our judgment. We're not judged with the wicked. That's the white throne judgment. That's at the end of the millennial reign, right? So this is the part we're called for. This keeps us focused forward, not backwards, and distracted by things around us in the present, but pressing with our eyes forward on the mark. We all know that famous verse. Paul said what? I press. People are like, I feel pressure. Then you're not pressing. The choice is I press or I get pressed. If you're being pressed, then you're not doing the pressing. But if you keep the press on, then it, the press can't catch you. Amen. Nobody has to shove me because I'm running forward. Stop shoving me. Stop pushing me. <laughs> then move it. Move it. Move it. Right? <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> this keeps us focused. And then Jude in verse 3, you with me, goes into false teachers. So he goes into our greeting, letting us know that whatever we were saved from, we were now to pay attention to being saved to. He immediately goes into false teachers. Verse 3, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Again, don't interpret the Bible with your American English vernacular. We think the word common means eh. Simple, common, common. Common in here means both Jews and Gentiles. In other words, it's what we have in common, both Jews and Gentiles. Not as in common as in unimportant and under-esteemed. Common as it was both the salvation of the Jews and Gentiles, belonging to them both. It's needful for me to write unto you and exhort you. Now, again, this is interesting because people are like, well, it doesn't ever sound like when you preach that it's exhortation. What about the exhortation, edification, and comfort? Well, <laughs> glad you asked. Because see, the word exhort means to call. If I were to whistle, hey, come here. I just exhorted you. Right. Now you know all of my teaching is exhortation. <laughs> he said, it's needful for me to write, to call you that you should earnestly contend. Notice how it says to contend. Not oh, I'm tired, lightly, I'll contend tomorrow, or just, okay, I'll contend a little. Tug, tug, tug of war, tug of war. Oh, I gotta watch Netflix. I'm beat. Yeah, earnestly contend. That's a little, that sounds a little bit different. That kind of means don't let go. <laughs> uh, what? For the faith. That word contend means, we talked about this morning, against an adversary. If you're aiming for the prize, do you think Satan's gonna go, Go right ahead. In fact, you know, the Gasparilla run was this weekend. Let me just cheer you on. Go run for that prize. 
You have an adversary that was going to trip you up, shove you off, knock you off the race course, out of the race at every single second. Yeah. Satan doesn't take time off and he doesn't watch Netflix. He's diligent. He spends 168 hours a week. How many is that? All of them. Yeah. Trying to deceive you and get you off the word. Your casual glance of 10 minutes of the word a day will not help you win that race. That's right. That will not defeat an adversary. So we are to earnestly contend against an adversary for the prize. He's not looking for the prize that's him. He's looking to take it from you, though. That's different. Can it be taken from you? If you let it if you let it, by casualness and lightness. So he says, for the faith, which was once delivered. So when was it delivered to you? When you got saved, it was delivered to the early church who was written, but it's up to you to hang on to it, which means he's telling you, you're gonna have constant opposition to you keeping what's yours. Um, so maybe it doesn't happen every day at your house, but if you look at these neighborhood apps and the news, is there not a single day that somebody doesn't post and say, somebody stole something out of my, my bike, my car, whatever? So what? The thief comes consistently, and it'll go from place to place to place. So he just goes away for a more opportune time. In other words, the thieves aren't sleeping on the job. So verse four, he said, there are certain men who crept in unawares. Now that word unaware doesn't mean they went, oh, no one can see me coming into the church. I'm creeping in unaware. What would that mean? Again, we're not gonna interpret the Bible with American English vernacular. It wasn't written in English. It was written in Greek. He said uh, unaware means they came in, they settled in alongside their seatmates, people on your right and your left, and they are comfortable and they were unaware, not they were unaware, who was unaware, you were unaware that there were wolves among sheep because we had become so casual, we could not tell the difference between the people that just, we walk in the church, not here, because the gifts of the Spirit keep a church clean and everything that tries just doesn't even make it through the door and if it does, it usually leaves on its own and if not, we have assistance. <laughs> crept in alongside, they were adapted to and at ease, who, the congregation, had become so comfortable and so casual with sin and worldliness they didn't even recognize it sitting right there. They didn't recognize it teaching their children. They didn't recognize it teaching the Sunday school. And then you wonder, how did it get in the pulpit? How did we end up with homosexual preachers in our pulpits? Right here, Jude's telling us. You're thinking, my word, did he just write this last year? Yeah, timeless. The word is timeless. And people are like, I don't read that thing. It hadn't changed in years. Aren't you glad? So we don't have to ask how. The Bible will tell us how these things happen. It'll also tell us how to prevent them. Isn't that good news? Settled in alongside, they were at ease. In 2 Peter 2.1, he talks about false prophets and teachers in the church. Now, what you might not have thought of is that can be defined two ways. There are people saying they are teachers called by God that are not. They would be a false teacher, yes? False prophet, false apostles. Those are really big right now, along with barfing in bags again, which is not new. It was going on when I was 14. It was going on uh, 2,000 years ago. Paul dealt with it. There is nothing new in the earth. Solomon already said that. God, Satan is an imitator. He repackages it for the next generation, and they think it's cool or new. Nothing's cool and nothing's new. And if that were the way we do it, I'd still send you home with it. You're not doing that in here on our carpet. But that's not how it's done, yeah. Um, if you're on a roller coaster, you might get shake, rattle, and roll, and you might vomit when you get off, but that's not puking up a devil. And so uh, false prophets and false teachers. But that also means there can be a teacher that's teaching false doctrine. But usually people go, well, I would recognize that. Not if you've never read your whole Bible. You, would, you wouldn't. Um, but you also may not recognize the fact that they're not actually called by God. Many people called themselves or someone else called them, and the Bible forbids you touching the mantles that belong to Jesus. There's things we don't touch. The Garden of Eden dictated there would be things that belonged to God that you were not allowed to touch. There were two trees, the, the tree that he told Adam and Eve not to eat and the one he made sure they couldn't eat, the tree of life where they would live forever in a sinful condition and they would perish and go to hell and God could not have redeemed them, not even with Jesus. That's why they were barred from the garden, not to be punished. 
That was for free. Come to the classes. You'll hear more about that stuff. Uh, prophets, and whip, I digress. We've got to stick with the book of Jude, right? Who are before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men. But notice how it define ungodly. And here's another thing that's tripping people up. But they said they're a Christian. So, yeah, people say there are a lot of things. There's women that say they're men. They don't make it so. A lot of people saying that they can do things, that they have money things, they're not telling the truth. Just because somebody says something or sticks a label on something doesn't make it so. So uh, they were before ordained to this. Un ungodly men are defined as people who are irreverent. We have a lack of reverence in the house of God. They speak irreverently. They behave irreverently. They dress irreverently. They're irreverent. They have no reverence for anything. Everything is common. Everything is base. Everything is casual and everybody's equal. None of that's true. Amen. All men are created equal, but they don't stay equal. Amen. What you do is up to you with the, the life God gave you, right? Uh, irreverent, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. When the grace, false grace message came out, it was to dilute the real one. Why? You would not be able to complete your race without understanding grace. But Paul, we don't need books and seminars on grace. Paul said, should I sin more that grace will increase? God forbid. Boom, bada bing, that's it. Grace is the ability not to sin. It was God's ability on your inability. In the old covenant, they didn't have grace. So they failed and they missed the mark. Grace was given to you by the blood of Jesus so you did not have to miss the mark. So you could have God's ability on your inability and you did not have to do anything in your own strength and thank God we don't have to come in here and put a cow on here and slit its throat and put buckets under here and light it on fire in this building. How ridiculous would that be? Aren't we glad we don't live in the Old Testament? <laughs> All sorts of things. We would have been those people that the ground opened up and swallowed, you know, because I complained about my coffee taking too long. <laughs> like to make coffee nervous. Yeah. Hurry up. <laughs> not, not you. You, wouldn't, you guys would never do that. Turning the grace of God. Lasciviousness is a wanton, casual disregard for the law. People who are headstrong, willful, uncalled for, and throw off restraint. I think Pastor was referencing, and you guys have seen this stuff. You've heard it because you're on social media too much. And uh, this pastor uh, came to his pulpit and brought a beer and popped it and guzzled it and said, God's not offended by this. A wanton regard for the law. That is this person that's being described. And we're going, I can't think of anyone. I don't know those people. What are they going to look like when they come? They're sitting right next to you. You're surrounding yourself with them. The unfortunate thing is all your electronic devices are putting it in front of your eyes and ears and bringing it right into your home and into your heart 24-7. Yes. Paul's not talking about where they have to creep into a church. Now, churches are full of those ways, but they're not, that's not what God's referring to. That's not the true church, right? Again, just because a building says church doesn't mean God's participating in anything. I'm not criticizing. I'm just stating here. I'm putting Jude in a modern language so we can understand. We're not waiting for this day. We've been living in it for a very long time. We really seriously need to wake up and smell the book of Jude. <laughs> with, your, with coffee, of course. <laughs> coffee brings a lot of revelation. If you need to double it, it's okay. Um, and the, notice he says they did this. And notice this is not a, a misprint or double. Denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm, that, why would Paul say that? Well, to deny the only Lord God, to deny the only Lord God is to deny his right to rule our lives. If I stand here and pop a beer and tell you God is okay, it's one thing to permit yourself wrongly. To be lascivious, it's another thing to tell other people they have permission. Amen. That's good. Yeah, and using a platform and calling it God and giving other people permission. The Bible talks about that you qualify for the millstone. Yeah. If you don't know what that is, look it up. You qualify for the millstone to be hung around your neck. And a millstone was about 36 inches by 36 inches and about 18 inches thick. A concrete necklace better than the mafia's pair of concrete shoes, and that you should be cast into the sea and drowned, that you should have never been born. Why? Because you led people astray. You took the things of God and you made them base, 
and you had flagrant disregard, and then you told them with a platform of authority that they were okay to do it. You deliberately led people astray. So denying the only Lord God, his right to rule. God has a right to rule your life, all of it. And if you disagree with that, then turn in your S card. Turn in your fire insurance card because it's a package deal. God, I want your free gift of salvation because I don't want to roast in hell. But you don't have a right to rule my life. He said, these are ungodly men. It doesn't matter if they put the label Christian on them. God calls them ungodly Amen. because they deny his right to rule their life because we didn't make a business arrangement with God. I'll trade this for that. Amen. He said, I'll give you my all. Thank you, sir. And I'll give you mine back. Amen. Who got the better end of that deal? <laughs> like, and we can't give him all that we owe him like it's chopped liver anyway. And we're going to withhold some of it because we got something better on the back burner, Right. That's, a, that's that special kind of crazy. That's that line where stupid goes to crazy, right? <laughs> so here are three chief sins of the ungodly. Number one, it says to place things differently, to change for oneself, to change one's opinion to a new one, to retract, to turn, to remove or change the meaning of an application. We have a lot of people preaching a whole lot of stuff and misquoting a lot of scripture and twisting the meanings. So that's what that means. The number one ungodly sin that God felt was the worst thing you could do. If you're like, what's the worst sin you could do? Change the meaning of God's word. He said, don't add to it and don't take away from it. The very last thing he said in Revelation is, this is really important. Do not add, anybody like being misquoted in here? Love people saying, you said things you didn't say, right? God doesn't like it anymore either. He doesn't want you adding to what he said. He doesn't want you taking it away. But in Timothy, it says, study to show yourself approve a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing, which means you can wrongly divide. And it says, you are not even to change by inference or voice inflection the meaning of something. No prophecy of scripture. Everybody was like, I want a word of prophecy. God called this whole book prophecy because he said it and he prophesied it. And he's not a prophet liar. So if you're short on word, prophetic words, Find yourself a few million right here. This is a, the Bible calls this a sure word. That means any man does not have a sure word, but this is a sure word of prophecy that you can build your life on. This is the only infallible truth. Every man, God said, let him be true and every man a liar. And that includes you because nobody lies to you like you lie to you. <laughs> nobody believes your lies, but you either. So. We're going to, uh, to turn things, to shift the meaning of. Then there are 17 works of the flesh. What are those? Read them later. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. 17 things. Witchcraft is a work of the flesh. Yeah. Demonic strongholds are generally strongholds in the mind, which is the soulish realm. That's not possession. You can't be possessed in your spirit as a Christian, but you can be oppressed in your mind because you like those voices. And you like feeling special and you like that attention and many people want to keep that. What is Jude talking about? What's going on right now all around us and among us? But, but not in this church, not in this building. People are free to come here as they are, but they are not free to stay as they are. That's the difference, right? We don't come in here and practice our doctrines and our opinions and our sins in God's house. You take that somewhere else. We are free to come as we are, but God loves you too much to stay that way. And thank God we have a pastor who loves you while he's pressing you to change. He is that spoonful of sugar that makes the medicine go down. If you weren't sure who was the medicine, you're looking at him. <laughs> Just in case you weren't clear. <laughs> I love my job and I'm good at it. I'm just teasing you. Pastor told me to be nice. I'm being nice. Okay, number two, they denied the right of God to rule their lives so they could continue in sin. That's right. They'll say things like this. Well, God knows my heart. Yes, he does. He said it was, bla it was a blackguard. It was wicked in all its ways. He sure does know it. Why are you bragging about that? Denied the right of God to rule their lives so they can continue in sin. Well, I love God in my own special way. He defined love, and he defined how he would know and feel your love. If you love me, you will obey com my commands. Amen. Anybody notice the S on the end of that, the plurality of it? 
Yeah, obey my commands. God is not, the, this, he is not a Hallmark movie. You can, you, can, you can feel your love for God, but God says, I feel your love for me from your obedience, Amen. your action. Not like telling him, that's awesome, show me. Amen. Anybody in here like to be shown love? And not just hear it and, your, and the actions not line up. Yes. Ever thought how God wants the same thing? See, that's the reason you want things. Guess where that came from? Your daddy God. You have the nature and the DNA on the inside of you. Every cell in your body is marked with the DNA of God. Why? How do you transfer DNA? Nurse, how do you transfer DNA? Can DNA be transferred through breath? Yeah. Yeah. He breathed his own breath into Adam. You, your breath is not your breath. It's God's breath. And Adam came alive. And in Adam's veins was blood when he sinned. And Jesus had to redeem that blood because Adam was going to live forever. He had glory. He was clothed with glory. That's con- blood is congealed light. If you speed it back up, it goes back into light. That's why when you go boom at the speed of light uh, in, a, in heaven's centrifuge up in the rapture, your blood will go back to light. Your flesh and bone, flesh and light without blood. Uh, Jesus emptied all his blood. He doesn't have any in his body either. It's at the mercy seat. But he had to cleanse that bloodline in you. So people say, well, that's in your bloodline. That's in your DNA. I have the DNA of God and the blood of Jesus flowing through my veins. Roderick and I are twins, <laughs> identical twins. He's my brother from another mother, but the same father. Yeah. There's no such thing as having to break hereditary curses and generation. You got born again into the family. You're a new creation. What part of new creation did we not grasp? You got to have somebody wave a pixie wand over me and go, now you're free. I was free when I got the DNA transfusion and my blood transfusion. And I'm going to stay free. Unless I just let those curses come on me. Curse away. Just make it your size because you're going to wear it. Boom, it rang. Yeah. Hallelujah. Are we keep, can we keep going? Are you okay? <laughs> Denying number three. Okay, so three chief sins of the ungodly. They change the meanings or application. They deny the right of God to rule their lives so they can continue in sin. And then number three, they deny the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter 2 1. That word deny the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't mean that I'm denying him as Jesus or God's son. It's denying his lordship. I contradict him. Anybody, you ever heard anybody say you would never? but we've heard other people, right, say these things. Well, I just have my own interpretation of that. I just kind of have my own relation with God. I kind of get a different meaning out of that. They contradict him. You go, it is written. Oh, well, I don't see it that way. (laughs) Counseling's over then. You don't counsel devils and you don't counsel rebellion very simple. Keeps all my appointments short. So we don't, (laughs) my, my, my board's like, you're going to have a second degree in counseling. Yeah, I'm going to do a five minute drive-by fruiting. Here's your prescription. When you have it memorized, come back and let me know how it's working for you. I want to tell you my problem. I already know what your problem is. We all know what your problem is. We, We can all see my problem. Our problems are visible. If you think you're hiding anything from anybody, again, you're lying to yourself and nobody's believing your lies, but, but you, why? Because we produce the fruit in keeping with our own repentance or lack thereof. Okay. So denying the Lord Jesus Christ meant they would constantly contradict his Lordship in the word and his Lordship in their lives. Contending for the original faith of the gospel, Judas was being destroyed by false teachers at the time of this writing. Has it changed today? No, No, but unfortunately, there's more people listening to them and can't tell the difference between the false and the real. Why? They don't know the word. They don't know God. They know about God, but they don't know him. They're unacquainted with how he speaks. So they don't know if it's God's voice or not because they're unacquainted to how he talks. You know, sometimes my husband, um, my oldest son called and his daddy was eating. So he tried to be like, hey, how you doing? Like he had the wrong number. He's like, dad, please. Like, <laughs> and he's like, oh, for just a second, I had you for a tenth of a second. Dad, if it makes you feel better, I'll give it to you. <laughs> but in other words, it wasn't the tone that he had food in his mouth. It's my dad wouldn't say that. 
And so it's not uh, the tone and go, gosh, I don't know if that was God's voice. My father would never say that. He would never talk like that. People should be able to say that about you. No, I don't believe what you just said about them because they don't speak like that. They don't say those things. I don't have to be there to hear it because I can just hear them right now and they don't sound like that. Amen? That's because you know somebody well. So even if they try to fool you with the change of tone, God changes his tone. Sometimes he talks real soft and sometimes he goes, hey, whatever's needed. Yeah, now that everyone's awake. Verse five, okay, we're like, hallelujah, we're only on verse five, yeah. In the words of Jeremiah the prophet, holy smoking coals and the altar with God. I'll speed up. Okay, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you knew, once knew this, what? You knew this once, how that the Lord, having saved the people, delivered, protected, and made whole Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. That word destroyed means that God had a separation and a departure. The Holy Spirit said he'll not strive with you forever. So he, let me just tell you, you'll be destroyed if God leaves you. But if you want lordship, he is a perfect gentleman. Be like, please take the seat back. He will not share the throne of your life. God won't share his glory. So it's him or you. And people get that bumper sticker off your car that says, God's my co-pilot. You confused, move over. You're in the wrong seat. Jude 1, 6, that's part of your problem. <laughs> the angels which kept not their first estate. And so this seems kind of weird. Why all of a sudden Jude's going to this? He's actually going back and explaining to you when we cross boundaries and we don't follow the law of God. And he's all going all the way back to the angels who did this. He's making his point. They kept not their first estate. That means their position, their place, their rank, but left their own habitation, their own dwelling house and boundaries. He hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness under the judgment of the great day. You're like, what in the world is that? Those are the angels that left the habitation that God created them for, moved down to the earth, usurped the will of man, or we should say women, had sex with them and created the Nephilim. People are like, yeah, they're coming back. No, they're not. It says right here, they're reserved in everlasting chains. That means permanent chains for the white throne judgment. They're in a special compartment in hell called Tartarus. Why? They left the habitation of their boundaries. They only left the boundaries that God created their place and rank. I mean, think of that. An angel who's at the throne of God and has power decides, and we think these movies are cute and romantic to watch about these men, angels, giving up their, their angelship to stay with a human woman. And we think that's cute and romantic. Sick. Twisted. Those angels have a special place in hell and they're held for the white throne judgment. That's why hell was created. It wasn't created for man. If you choose to join them, then, then that's up to you. God won't take your free will away. But it wasn't created. It was created for Satan and his angels that went with him. They're held there. So uh, what difference is it when people today are saying, I was created a man, but I, God made a mistake. He's a screw up and I'm a woman. I'm leaving my habitation. How about saying that I'll call myself to pastor people and get on YouTube and say, I'm your pastor and you don't need a pastor. No accountability. We're not paying attention. We're going, whoa, that's serious. Whoa, it's serious. And it's going on all around us. Yeah. God has boundaries. He said he marked out your boundaries. And people go, yeah, I just, my days are numbered. No, he said your boundaries. He didn't say your days. He said you could have at least 120. If you want more, you can have more. He said you can have at least 120. He said, but you have boundaries. You have tent stakes. You are not to take authority that has not been given you. You don't take what belongs to that. He will give you all that is authorized in the covenant. But covetousness is wanting what somebody else has as if God doesn't have enough for you. Oh, I like that. I'll think I'll take their wife. I'll take their position. No, that's covetousness. You are coveting something that God is not offering you. And you're telling him what you have is not, not as good. I, I'm better at picking. I know what I like. Yeah, and you, we know where that'll take you. Yeah. So verse seven, even as Sodom and Gomorrah. So he goes into referencing that people continued in this journey and the cities about them. So they weren't the only ones in like manner. Do we not have places like that today? 
giving themselves over to fornication. In the Bible, fornication is synonymous with homosexuality and adultery. People go, well, fornication is sex before marriage. In the Bible, it's synonymous because, again, the original Greek means it doesn't matter if you have sex before marriage, you have sex with somebody else that you're not married to, or you have homo means same sex. It's not complicated that you have sex with some, or bestiality, you have sex with an animal of any kind. God says, though he put boundaries in, can you cross them? Yeah, the angels could cross them too. <laughs> but their decision is now sealed. So he put boundaries in, and if you usurp those boundaries, he said, they were living contrary to nature, to God's laws and boundaries, and his sexual boundaries, and giving themselves over and going after strange flesh. Anything that God did not authorize, heterosexual within the bounds of marriage, was to be celebrated as God gave you the best wedding gift. There's no china platter that was going to compare to your wedding night. <laughs> but because you decided to break it out early, it really has no meaning on that wedding night. You should have skipped the wedding and go on a honeymoon. That's just your vacation. Because God was holding the best wedding present anybody ever had. And if you weren't sure how good it was going to be, Adam went, whoa, man. <laughs> God made Adam and said, I can do better. <laughs> Adam's like, yep, that's better. Yeah. <laughs> Not complicated. So God's like, when you become joined, I'm going to do you better than grandma's china. The most best and expensive present. But we just can't wait because we want to take what God has not authorized, and we want to cross boundaries. And because God gave you a free will, he cannot and will not stop you. You will have to do that for yourself. And we wonder that why our lives don't go in the right direction. We're like, whoa. Okay, verse 8. Likewise also, also these filthy dreamers. Why does he call them filthy dreamers? Because God was going to give you dreams. Visions and dreams, right? But there would be dreams from God, and there would be those that had filthy dreams. What are those? Nighttime filthy dreams and fantasies during the day. Filthy dreamers defiling the flesh. They despise dominion. That dominion was the majesty of God's government. There are people that despise protocol. In this church, I despise the government of the church. Right, because you're a rebel without a cause because there's no cause for rebellion. So they despise the majesty of God's government and it says they speak evil of dignities. That means evil of things done in the glory, uh, of I call personas in the glory. You guys realize that heaven has a posse. It's made up of far more than the Trinity. You have the archangel. You have Gabriel, the messenger. Michael's the only one identified as the archangel. You have the chief angels. Um, you have the Metatron angel. You got all sorts of cool stuff. The eye has not seen, ear has not heard. Heaven has a posse. That means a posse is something that rules with authority and power. Heaven has a posse that you're going to ride with. You want to hear seven words and you want to take one ride, but you're going to have to qualify for both. <laughs> They're both not in this life. It's going to be worth qualifying for. I was talking to my friend who's 94 today, an LCU student, 94, and I always say, I love talking to you, Miss Rena, because I'm the next person that says they just can't do their paper, can't come to school. I got a 94-year-old, has an eyesight problem, health problems, many problems, but send me the next class. I'm going to learn until... I, I go into glory because she wants to take the ride. So I said, I got my outfit picked out. I've had my horse picked out. The color, his name, and I know what I'll be wearing because that matters. I'm going on the ride. And I don't, want, I don't want to be in the class I'll be waving to, Faith 101, <laughs> Jude 101. See you guys later. Where are you going? The ride. Amen. It says he's coming with the saints, but you have to be a skillful swordsman to take that ride to the Battle of Armageddon with the angel. I'm not missing that. Hair blowing back in the wind. Oh, even if you're thinking, I don't like horses, trust me, you will. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be good. You don't want to miss it. You want to hear seven little words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and you qualify for the ride. I do not want to. We're going to be learning for all eternity, but I really don't want to miss that because I had to be in class because I refused to accept and understand. I denied his right to rule my life on this earth, and I squeaked into heaven, and now everything cool going on, I'm looking out the window. I don't want to get to Paul's class, because I'm going to Paul's class. Paul goes, this is a master's class. We'll need you to go back to Andrew's class. 
the Apostle Andrew or Stephen, the deacon's class, because you're not prepared. You, you missed a few basic things down there. Good night. Like you missed out on everything here, and now you got to sit in the classroom. I mean, thank God that some people are going to squeak in at the last minute for mercy, but um, there's just too many cool things that I don't want to miss out on. I'm sure you don't either. Okay, so uh, filthy dreamers. Yet Michael, the archangel, with contending, verse 9, the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. He durst not or he dared not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. That means there, that Michael didn't play with spiritual things. Don't play with spiritual things. They're not a joke. The seven sons of Sceva found that out. Although a five-year-old has the faith to cast the devil out. Brayton could cast the devil out of, of, of anybody. So it's not measures of power and anointing, but it's important not to play. If Michael the archangel, basically he said he didn't contend. He wasn't in a tug-of-war with Moses' body. Really? Like Satan would be in a tug-of-war with Michael the archangel. He trains the host of heaven on a separate part of the planet called heaven. But Jesus is the captain of that host, but Michael is the trainer of the entire heaven's military. <laughs> it's not going to be a tug of war. No, basically what that means is, is Michael put Moses' body behind him and said, the Lord rebuke you. You could take this issue up, up with him. Because Satan wanted Moses' body. Why? So that they could make a shrine and worship him. And God, God buried him, and to this day, they don't know where he's buried. Because when God knows how to hide something, he hides it. <laughs> you're not, you're not going to find it, right? Okay, but we, we know Moses is okay because he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, so it's okay. He's not still in the dirt, right? Okay, so he was contended, but the Lord rebuke you, Jude 110. But these speak evil. These are talking about people. Vilify and defame those things which they know not. So he's saying they even criticize and judge things they don't even know. I've had people... Uh, to, type on pastor's Facebook uh, all sorts of correction of his doctrine. They don't even read their Bible. I'm not even qualified. Anybody in here feel qualified to correct their boss? If you do, I suggest a lobotomy. Uh, the Bible says, I like to paraphrase things that we can understand, and this is Pastor Marie's translation. Correction upward is both stupidity and rebellion. Stupidity and rebellion. Stupid can be cured. <laughs> rebellion is a little bit tougher. Uh, so we're talking about, uh, he said, they know not. What they know naturally is brute beast. They go by their physical senses. There are people that say, God said, or God's leading me, but they're going by their physical senses. But they've convinced themselves that that's God. But it doesn't line up with the word, but they don't care if it lines up with the word or not. I know what I heard, I know what I saw. Yeah, you exalted voices and visions above God's word. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will stand. If anything is contrary to this, you were to measure on this, that gets thrown out this days, Amen. right? Because you'll be accommodated if you look for those things. They know naturally as brute beast and those things, in other words, they corrupt themselves. Who corrupts them? Satan. Satan is not corrupting you. It says you corrupt yourself. Verse 11, woe unto them. For they have gone the way of Cain, ran greedily after the error of Balaam, and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. So this is Cain, the first brother, Abel's brother. And then we have Korah. Kor is Korah, the one who the ground opened up and swallowed him and a bunch of other people with him. And then we have Balaam, the dude riding the donkey that's beating the donkey because the donkey won't go. And the don God opens the donkey's mouth. He's like, why are you hitting me? <laughs> Um, so what, what, in other words, why was Jude say that? In other words, he's going all the way back to the first, you know, brother that rebelled. Cain knew what was required of him because Adam taught them both. But Cain said, eh, I'm just going to bring you some smushy tomatoes for my offering and you need to like what I give you and be happy with it. But we do that all the time to God. God, here's your tip and you need to be happy. You need to be grateful, God, that I just showed up in the building yeah. and, and, and gave you five bucks when you spend more than that on coffee. And so this is what, what Cain did. He rebelled against what God said and said, I'll be God and I'll decide what you get and what you don't and what's good enough for you. And what's good enough for you is a basket of rotten tomatoes when he said, bring a lamb. And then what did Korah do? Korah told Moses, who do you think you are telling me what to do? I'm equal to you. We hear God's voice. But yeah, we have people all around us that go, pastor can't tell me what to do, or pastor's the only one that can tell me what to do. That's false honor. That's false respect. That's worse. 
than saying, oh, you can't, I can't be told what to do. Oh, only they can tell me what to do. No, actually, nobody can. And Korah uh, raised his hand against God's authority, and Moses tried to intercede for him. And he asked him to, to not do that and repent, and the next morning come back, and he's like, the Bible says he stood there in his tent and wouldn't even come when Moses summoned him. So Moses was like, all right, I recommend all y'all step back. <laughs> you can be close to the good fire or close to the bad fire, but either way, you're getting it. And so he said, get away from them. And he said, if he dies a normal death, then I'm a, I'm a false prophet and a liar. But if he dies in a way we haven't seen before, and whoosh, the ground opened up and swallowed him, and they went down into hell alive. Him, his wives, his children, his daughters, his sons, his grandchildren, and all his animals and all of his possessions. Your decisions affect the people around you. And then, of course, Balaam. What was Balaam saying? The same thing. Greedy, covetousness, wanted God's reward. God called him to prophesy, but he sold his soul for money. He said, I'm going to sell myself to the highest bidder. If you want this prophecy, it'll cost you, let's see, this, this prophecy that you'll win the battle will be this much. And he had a bill of sale, and he was riding the donkey to collect his payment. He was a prophet for hire, a prophet liar. How many people, well, I don't know anybody like that. Click pay to play on YouTube. Subscribe to my channel. Buy this next book. Amen. We are paying to play. You are paying for profit line. You are praying for uh, familiar spirits to talk to you. All sorts of things. Because why? You're, you're, you're unhappy with God himself and his word. So we would have thought Jude wrote this in 2023. He did write it. The word is timeless, okay? And it's carrying us all the way into our future. So this was their sin. They made light of God's laws. Jude verse 12. These are spots in your feast. These are men and women. These are people. They are spots, he said, in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, they feed themselves. Hmm, by feeding themselves and building their kingdoms and building their followings and building their social media platforms and feeding themselves. A pastor feeds the flock before he feeds himself. And he takes nothing, like Moses said, I've taken nothing from you. They feed themselves without fear. They're not even afraid they have no reverence. They eat like Proverbs, like the woman, and wipe their mouth and say, I've done no wrong. <laughs> That's what Proverbs says about the, uh, the, the woman who commits adultery. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done no wrong. They feed themselves. They're without fear. They are clouds without water. That means that anybody ever needed rain really bad or was like, come on, rain, it's going to rain. My grass needs watering. I want to turn my sprinklers off because I want free water. <laughs> and, and then it just keeps blowing over and keeps blowing over and keeps blowing over. He said, that's what they are. They come, but then you never get the refreshing water of the word. It didn't say you didn't get something. Anybody ever seen acid rain? Yeah. yeah. But they are clouds without the refreshing water of truth from the word. Carried about by winds. Trees whose fruit withers. They have diseased fruit. False prophets and teachers. It says twice dead. Yes? That means they're backslidden. You can't be twice dead unless you were alive by salvation once and chose deliberately to move back from that. Twice dead plucked up by the roots is what it says about these men and women. And what happens to them? Love feasts were actually held in up to the third and fourth century, which was the 300 or 400. Uh, and they, they eventually stopped that because what the church was doing, it was bringing uh, food and they were supposed to kind of what we might have a potluck or a pot blessing and share alike. But, but uh, they had to put a stop to it because it got into excess. And even Paul had to rebuke that. He said, you're coming in here and you're bringing your food, but you're eating in front of people who didn't bring anything. They're poor and they don't have anything. Instead of taking communion and making it a holy time, you're just feasting in front of people and you're not even sharing it. So he's, he, Paul's like, knock it off. But by this time, they had said this, this had become a cesspool and you can imagine what else was going on. 
So they were forbidden, they were prohibited since the third and fourth century um, because they got off. He said they're spots though. They're a reef, a rock in the sea. In other words, these people among us are like a ship. I'm a ship trying to sail into my destiny and they are hidden reefs that I'm gonna run into and it's gonna, it's gonna hit the bottom of my boat and I'm gonna sink. But it's your responsibility to navigate the waters properly with the word and the spirit and not run into those people to recognize that. What? Turn the wheel. Navigate around that. Amen. Oh, well, we have to love everybody. Yep, but I don't have to follow everybody. Verse 13, it says, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, their trouble. They've ever been around people that, that seem like it's God, but there's an agitation. They're always... It looks, it looks like they're happy and excited, but you feel agitated and you feel worn out around them. Not like our pastor. He's just joy personified. <laughs> and then, but you always feel refreshed around him. Why do I feel agitated? It doesn't look like agitation, but it feels like agitation. It is what it is. A spade is a spade. They're troubled, therefore they're troubling. Just because it's uh, clothed in a package of charisma and right words does not mean that it won't cause trouble in your life. There's only humans that, that God has and Satan has. When God wants to bless your life, he sends a person. When Satan wants to curse your life, he sends a person. But unfortunately, sometimes we decide not to be able to tell the difference. Let me tell you this. Uh, Satan has to work harder than God, so he sends more. Raging waves. This is what it says about them. They are unsubmitted without direction and guidance of true authority uncommitted in a local church. So when COVID came, everybody decided they would leave the local church because a pastor, a real pastor, wouldn't give them a voice in the church because they were not authorized to instruct. And so they decided to get on social media platforms and instruct and go, well, my pastor lives in another state, but you're surrounded by a hundred churches. Oh, well, we can't find one because we are above that. If you are above being Christian 101, you have stopped soul winning, you have stopped tithing, you have stopped serving, you would not be qualified for ministry because you are given more, who much is given, much is required. Our pastor is the biggest giver in our church. He's the biggest server in our church. There's no toilet that he hasn't plunged and no hole in the roof he hasn't plugged when most people are at other places are sleeping whether he is overseas picking up other people's trash in a foreign country or picking up trash out here. So we have not left Christianity 101 to become ministers. We have to keep all that and keep adding to that. But when people say, oh, I have a higher calling or I'm above that, or yeah, I have a guy, I, I call him every now and then and he tells me I'm wonderful. Well, he doesn't really know you and what you are or aren't doing. Oh, well, I have a pastor in name only. Mm-hmm. And, and let me ask you, Saver told you to, to do something and you didn't want to do it and you did it? Well, no. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really ever get past three questions because I'm not interested at that point anymore. I already know the answer anyway. They are unsubmitted. They're without direction and guidance of true authority. The more, Jesus said, a man who is in authority will be under authority. People want to be in authority and free themselves from authority. People are like, Hester Marie, how do you have so much authority? I got more authority than you could shake a stick at. I have 19 board members, a spouse. Uh, I have a lot of authority that speaks into my life. The farther we go, the more authority we have, not less. And some people can't take authority over their own sock drawer. Amen. They can't boss themselves around, but they want to boss everybody else around. You got to be good at bossing yourself first. And you got to be a follower. And then you have to be ever increasingly good at submitting. You have to be highly skillful at submission, not be going, when do I get out of here? As soon as you want to soon as you want to go. Free to go, right? Verse 14, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands. Notice the phrase. That is not a number, ten thousand. Ten thousands is an expression of an indefinite number of his saints. And this is, of course, in the millennial reign. That's the ride that you want to be on. Verse 15, what? To execute judgment upon all. The Bible says in Ephesians, the church is a teacher of angels. So we are going to be executing judgment on all. And to convince them that are ungodly among them, that means there'll be people on this earth 
that are not saved, that live through the uh, tribulation, convince them of their ungodly deeds that they have ungodly committed and their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. We got a lot of people railing their hand against God. We have a lot of uh, public Satanism and Hollywood tries to display it as a joke, but it's not a joke. They're participating in it and the occult openly hoping you don't notice that you think it's funny or a halftime show or a, a show at the, the Emmys or whatever you call that stuff. I don't even know. Verse 16, these are murmurers and complainers. This is why it's so critical you not murmur and complain because when you murmur and complain, even about your coffee not being hot enough or whatever, you fall into the category Remember, Korah had the ground opened up. People had the ground open up and swallowed for complaining. That's what I told my boys. You don't like that? I'm going to package that and give it to somebody else on the table, but you don't complain or the ground will open up and swallow you. <laughs> they believe me. Why? Because they knew I'd make it happen. <laughs> These are murmurers and they are complainers. What's murmuring? Well, just, I, I don't know why we're going to do that. I just don't know why my boss is them. My boss is just, he's just not that smart. You know, I don't know why our pastor is always wanting us to do that murmuring. You got something to say about everything. And on the problem is you do it under your breath or you post it on Facebook so you don't get punched in the mouth. <laughs> Complainers. Walking after, I'm sorry, I need to be nice. Um, <laughs> walking after their own lusts. Their mouth speaketh great swelling words. Arrogance, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage means they pretend devotion to rich men to gain money, power, and influence. There are people that pretend they're devoted to their pastor or devoted to men and women of God. Oh, I'm here to carry your briefcase. He is no BMOG, big man of God. He needs help carrying his briefcase. No, he'll carry his and yours. We're usually stuck with all that in the mission field unless Matt's there. <laughs> then he carries a the luggage. Um, we don't want to be respecter of people. We want to give honor properly and dignity and respect to all people. We don't want to follow people hoping for position. But there are people that will clamor. You've seen it at work. They have a different expression for it, and I won't say it because I don't want to have to be edited. Um, as if, I'm sorry, there's probably a lot of edits already, but uh, there is a different expression when you do that at work. And so... Um, <laughs> But it happens in the church and in the kingdom of God as if that's how God promotes. God promotes character. And, and character um, is defined by what you do when no one's watching but God and what you do for people that can't do anything for you. Verse 17, you're like, Pastor Marie, are we done? Almost, hang on. <laughs> Rounded that bend, but beloved. So then he's given a call to persevere. Remember ye the words which were spoken of before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 18, how they told you there would be mockers in the last time. And you, you should walk, who would walk after their own on God. What is a mocker? Two things, somebody that scoffs. They're so radical. That's so excessive. God doesn't really mean that. I mean, we hear that coming out of Satan's mouth to Eve. Well, God didn't really mean that. Let me tell you what he meant. Um, so that was in the garden. That's not new. So when you hear that, go, whoa, that sounds familiar. Um, they scoff and they teach falsely. To teach falsely doesn't mean I have to be a teacher. You can look at somebody's Facebook post and go, oh, that sounds good. See, so that's what Eve thought. That's philosophy. That's not even the Bible. But most Christians are like, oh, thumbs up. That's awesome. That's not even the gospel. That is error. But we're like, that sounds really good. Well, that's what she thought too. Till you took the bite. Till you go, that sounds good. Now it went down in your heart. You gave voice to it. You answered it. You clicked on it. Now that's part of you. So all that, all that stuff you're feeding on. So we're scoffing by false teaching and we're listening to false teaching. It doesn't mean it's a teacher or teaching you falsely. Anybody, you can yoke yourself under and listen to them and they're teaching you. You got to watch that. This will happen in the last days. Verse 19, listen to this, because you'll be recognizing all this around. This is not for us to go, ooh, I spy with my holy eye. And let me start judging everybody and being suspicious of everybody. This is like every other scripture to judge ourselves. For us to go, Lord, what am I not paying attention to? What have I been casual about? What have I not even noticed? What have I let crept in unknowingly? Or what have I participated in with some rebellion in my heart? 
You need to be a person who can be easily led, and to be easily led, you have to be able to be told. And people are like, well, you just, they can't be told. Congratulations. What do you want for that? You're a rebel without a cause because there's no cause for rebellion. You, you need to seek inspection and instruction. That's what keeps you safe, right? These be they who separate themselves. Sensual, having not the spirit. Separate themselves from what? The Greek says from the true church and those who demand holy living. See, people don't want to be a part of a church that says, we love you, but you can't do that here. Now you can get free. We can help you stay free. We're here to serve you. We're here to help you. But we're not going to condone that. That's not love. Love is not permissive. Right. Amen. God is love. So what he looks like is love. He's holy. He's righteous. He asks it of us. He said, I'll help, help you do it. Why? Because I want to bless you. I want you to walk in the blessing. They separate themselves from the true church. How many people have left the church and saying under the pretense of superior wisdom and ideals? I don't need to serve. I don't need to be a part of a local body. I have my own calling and my own ministry. Yeah, you're an island unto yourself. <laughs> and uh, that's not only ineffective, that's not a way to build anything. You can't build a business that way. You certainly can't build the kingdom. But uh, the Bible says when you're on the fringe, you're on the outside, you're picked off by the wolf. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when you're picked off by the wolf, you're either done or you become the wolf that does the picking off. So you're gonna have to, to, you're gonna have to choose whether you're picked off or you become the picker. And so when people are separating themselves from the tutor, those that demand holy living under pretense, it calls them in verse 19, they are sensual. That word sensual does not mean sexual. It means they are sensual. They live by their five physical senses and call it the Holy Spirit. I feel. Don't use that word. If you have a problem identifying between God's voice and yours or the will of God and emotions, just stop using that word until you can sort that out because it's, it's not helping you. Uh, and so he says, uh, having not the spirit. They, he said they don't have the spirit when they do that, but that's the very thing they say on the way out. The Holy Ghost said, I hear the voice of God for myself and you can't tell me anything. Oh, I talked to the pastor. Yeah, he told you, go whatever thou doest, do as quickly. And you didn't remember that that's what Je Jesus said to Judas. Because you came back and said, yeah, I talked to the pastor. This is what he said. Go and go quickly. Go and do what you need to do quickly. Wow, where have I heard that before? Right, Went over their head. When we talk to authority that we've already made the decision, they're not a, a true authority is not going to argue with you, and they're not going to try to talk you out of it. And they know what they don't know, already know that they don't have your ear. The most they might say is that's not the word. You don't have scripture on it, but I love you anyway, and so does God love you. Be warmed and be filled. Let me help you with your bags. Yeah. Seven commands to Christians. So this is what Jude tells us on the way out of his uh, bullet points. Verse 20. And there are seven things in here, and this is important that you underline them because these are the commands to you. If you don't want to be any of those things, you're like, whoa, stay, stay away from that. That's like, I got enough problems, right? But you, beloved, that's us, right? We're the beloved. Build yourself up on your most holy faith. And this is one of the mis most misquoted verses. Is there a comma after that word? Uh-huh, and it's in there. Build yourselves up on your most holy faith, comma, praying in the Holy Ghost. So people go, I need to build myself up by praying in the Holy Ghost. Is that what that said? You're not paying attention. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word. So Jude was saying, hear the word, build yourself. He said, beloved, build yourselves up on your most holy faith, comma, then he's going to give you another thought. But we've co-joined that. So when you pray in the spirit and you don't read the word, you become a fruit loop. Yes. Yes. Why? The Holy Ghost only prays in line with the word. So Pastor Marie, what's a ratio? If we have one hour, 45 minutes of Bible reading and 15 of praying. Why? That prayer has got to confirm the word. So when Paul said to pray without ceasing, he was right in two-thirds of the New Testament. He was in the word. He was with the word. So his prayer had a foundation to not be an error to cause his life and ours to move forward. But people that pray don't have the word, they become nutballs and say that God is saying all sorts of things that God's not saying. Amen. Why? No, no foundation for it to rest upon or be measured upon for accuracy. 
You can't be praying in the Spirit. To pray in the, says pray in the Holy Ghost, the Amplified says pray in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Spirit is not the same as praying in tongues. We're like, yeah, I was praying in tongues. I made my grocery list. I went grocery shopping. I got the laundry done. I was right. You were just babbling. Did you bring faith to that? And did you dip down in? And did you move into the place of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit connected with your spirit and things begin to move? That is the beloved build yourselves up in your most holy faith by reading the word and praying in the Spirit, not in tongues. Now it can take place in tongues, but you can be in the spirit and command in English and it'll move when it won't move outside of that place in the spirit. You can confess till the cows come home and leave again, but you move to a place in the spirit that you dip down in your spirit and your faith is connected. And all of a sudden you'll be praying or you'll be praying in an unknown tongue and you'll say something in English and it'll finally happen because what you were praying in, in the spirit, not in tongues. You can pray in tongues and make a grocery list, which means there is no faith, and you will become a fruity loop. What's he doing? Keeping us safe, keeping us in the last days, keeping us anchored, keeping us from getting shipwrecked, helping us say, this is wrong and this is wrong, stay here. Go this direction and you'll be safe and you'll finish your course and you'll establish the kingdom. You'll help others, you'll snatch them out of hell and your reward will be great. Not complicated. Or you can get over here and be constantly car crash. Have you ever had seen someone's car? You're like, how did you wreck your car 360 degrees? How did you wreck every side of this car? Did that happen all at once? Or are you just constantly in a demolition derby? You can't drive to save your life. You shouldn't even have a license. If I saw you, anybody seen a car like that? I, I see cars on the highway, and if they have just a little swerve, I'm like, oh, sister, sister, mister. Because I... I you got a problem on that side. You know, vision where I stay away from stuff that looks like that. I'm like, they have issues. They, they're bumping into the guardrail and everybody else. What's dude trying to go? I, he's trying to keep you from guttering the ball and from smashing your vehicle up on all four sides. I, got, I don't even fix it anymore because it's all four sides. At least it matches. <laughs> Please take the, the fish bumper sticker off the back of your car. Please take the God is my co pilot off the back of your car. Please take anything that has to do with God off that car. Yes. God is not in your car. <laughs> he does not ride in a death trap. <laughs> I don't know why I'm talking about that. Anyway, it's funny when you're driving down the road. Praying in the Holy Ghost, it means in the Spirit with faith. And then he gives you, so that's two things. Build yourself up, then you are to pray in the Spirit with faith, and then you're to keep yourself in the love of God. You are to keep yourself. God help me with love. Love is on the inside of you. Amen. What are you asking him for? He's on the inside of me. What do I do? I read 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 4 through 8 every day in a different translation. Why? Because my, my mind needs to hear it six ways to Sunday. So uh, my job is to keep myself in love. And I do that through the word and through faith, right? And then number four, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, you're looking for that boat rowing over the horizon at 1201. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. What, for the purpose of helping people get to eternal life. Not so that you can live on mercies every day, all day, because you didn't want to live by faith. You wanted to need mercy instead of provide it for other people. You wanted to need a miracle all the time instead of help other people receive a miracle. Unto eternal life, verse 22, and so, of some, listen to this, some have compassion, making a difference. But notice making a difference, that word making, we would think, well, I need, to, I need to make a difference in their life. That's not what that word means in the Greek. This is what it means. To discern, decide, and separate between those that are weak from ignorance, not willful, just untaught, and those who are proud and arrogant of heart and unwilling to obey the truth they've heard. You were to tell the difference. You were to make the difference by, I was able to make out the difference. Instead of petting the willfully ignorant and telling them it's gonna be all right. It's not gonna be okay. So he said, you are to be able to discern why. There were some people that were not going to accept help. 
that we're not going to accept the word as their help. You are not the answer because you are not the savior. If you offer the word and they're like, that's not for me, or you know what, I prefer something else, Facebook, somebody else, it's more exciting, that's too boring for me, you can't help them. Amen. Because Jesus couldn't. He said he could do no great work. Why? Because they didn't believe. So if he couldn't do it, are you better than him? No, you're not the Savior. You can take them to him, but you're not the Savior. So you don't switch up and go, well, if they just talk to me long enough or counsel with me. You can't counsel rebellion. Amen. Can't be counseled. It has to be repented of, right? So he said you were to be able to tell the difference. And others, so he says, other people, you are to save with fear. That wasn't scare them to death. He said alarm. This message is a bit alarming. I hope it scared, scared the, the pants off some people. Not y'all, of course, anybody on the recording later. It was not, not here. Uh, you, are to, you are, in other words, to, to alarm them about the path they're on. Yes. I'm warning you. Please don't do that. Please don't go that way. The bridge is out. I beg you not to do that. I have heard pastors say, I beg you not to do that. And they've done it. Yeah. I beg you not to do that. You're breaking my heart. They do it anyway. They're hell bent on their own destruction. They will not listen. So he said, in other words, alarm them, save them with fear. Why? Pulling them out of the fire. Literally and figuratively, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. That would be things that are used to cover the flesh. You are to hate the things that conceal the flesh that is destroying people. It's like they have leprosy and gangrene that's killing them from the inside out. And you're not supposed to pretend that that's not going on and be the person that flatters them and tells them how wonderful they are and beauty, beauty, cutie, cutie, it'll be all right. You're lying to them. You know what people are saying? Well, I was being loving. You were loving yourself because you wanted them to like you instead of you love them. And love tells the truth and knows they might get socked in the jaw and say, I don't want to be your friend anymore because you told me the truth. That's why I told you the truth, because I love you. I put my skin in the game, and I'll help you. And you can be mad at me. But instead, I wanted to flatter and pet because I wanted them to like me. And you just let them remain in their error. You think that's, that's okay with God? Don't be running in a popularity contest over God. In other words, that's exalting yourself above him. So verse 24, now he gives the doxology, the closing. Now unto him, him who is able to keep you. Notice he didn't, wasn't automatic. God is able to keep you, but not without your full cooperation. That he's able to watch over you, guard you, and preserve you. What? From falling, from stumbling, and to present you faultless before the presence, directly in front of his glory, the honor of his throne with exceeding joy. I, we want Jesus to go, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Father, look, look who I have. I'm presenting them faultless. I, they allowed me to work their keeping power. Amen. Not just the re search and rescue mission all the time. Yeah. People are like, well, I don't have a testimony. How about I was kept? by the power of God through my faith Amen. that I didn't spend my whole life on the brink of hell. Amen. The keeping power of God is the greatest testimony any of us will ever have the opportunity. He's kept me from the evil one because I believed him and I let him. That's a much more powerful testimony than I was going to crack hell wide open. I was dancing on the bar. That's great for what God saved us from. But we've made those exalted testimonies instead of he's kept me. And here Jude is going to him who is able to keep you from all of it. You're, we don't need your kids and your grandkids to have any more of those testimonies. I told my own kids, you won't have time to make it back. Amen. You get off the road, you're not going to get back. Amen. And they all have to camp on the mercy of God that Jesus, thank God, holds the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He didn't give you those keys. So you, you may die and go to hell and come back up, but that's all I got. But guess what? You won't get your destiny can stand for your salvation, but I can't stand for the fulfillment of your destiny because God doesn't authorize me to. Do you want to spend the one life you have and not fulfill your calling? Don't get off and think you have time to come back because you were casual 
because you, you time you don't have tomorrow you're not guaranteed tomorrow, but he holds tomorrow. There's a difference of him holding tomorrow to keep it for you, not from you. Amen. And you to being casual and dismissive of it and act like you automatically have it. That's different, isn't it? He can keep us, present us faultless. Why? Be not because you did everything right but because Jesus did everything right. And even if five minutes before I die, I sinned and I repent, then it's washed in the blood. And then God says, you're faultless. Thank you. I know. Thank you, Jesus. Because Jesus, not because of me, in spite of me. Amen. Yeah. Present you faultless in verse 25. And this one I want to read from the Amplified. To the on one only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, splendor, majesty, might, and dominion, and power, and authority before all time, now and forever, unto the ages of eternity. This is not Jude saying some nice saying. What is he saying? This is the portrait of your life. Don't go, I give you glory, God, and then not live a life that glorifies him. You cannot give him glory with your mouth. You can worship him, but you can't glorify him without your actions. So he's telling you the keeping, what the keeping power will do for you. Listen to that and read that and go, man, that's what my life's going to look like this year. Because what are these messages for? To position us to receive the more of 2024. God said it was so much more on this door into 2025 that 2025 would be pulled into 2024. But there is a posture and there is a position and there is a protocol that we have to follow to receive that. And God loves us so much. He doesn't want you to miss out on one jot or tittle of what he's got. He wants you to have exceedingly abundantly and so he offers it to us. So Jude went from Genesis to Revelation in eternity past, present, and eternity future in just 25 verses and told you what you're living in and how to win in life in it. Amen. Amen. Stand to your feet. Thank you for joining us today. To learn more about our international ministry and how to become a partner, visit jackmeyersministries.com or lifefamilychurch.net.